right, everybody. So we're going to build off of what we talked about in the intro to diabetes lecture. And we're going to talk here about some acute complications of diabetes. And this is, again, something that is so commonly tested on multiple choice questions. And it's probably one of the most common scenarios that will come up on CCS if you're taking step three. So you've got to know how to manage this. You need to know it in your sleep. If you haven't subscribed to my Patreon yet, please consider doing it. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right hand corner. I appreciate all of your contributions to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel and you'll get updates and notifications as I put more and more videos up. All right, so there are two real big emergent complications of diabetes. Yes, you can get nephropathy and you can get retinopathy and neuropathy and all that stuff, but those are chronic complications. Those are things that happen years and years, if not decades down the road. But when we talk about things that can show up all of a sudden, we're talking about two things. Diabetic ketoacidosis, particularly in type 1 diabetics, and this thing called hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, which has had multiple names over the years, um, just I'm going to refer to it as HHS. That tends to be in type 2 diabetics. So DKA, you've heard of this. What is, uh, what is this? It's due to a severe insulin deficiency, and that's why it tends to be in type 1 diabetics. These are people who just don't have any insulin. And so they can't bring sugar into their cells. Their cells think they're starving. These patients are going to be hungry. They're spilling a bunch of sugar into their urine, causing a high urine volume. They're going to be peeing everywhere. And consequently, they're going to be dehydrated. So polyuria, polydipsia, and um, they can have uh, polyphagia as well. Now, these patients, because they are unable to metabolize glucose, what are they going to do? They're going to metabolize fat. What is a byproduct of fat metabolism? ketones, okay? And ketones will push uh, bicarb out of your blood, and so they will develop an acidosis. Now, these ketones are not measurable, so they're going to have an anion gap metabolic acidosis. That is important for you to remember. Now, a lot of times, DKA will be precipitated by something, either an infection, non-compliance with their insulin, a big problem with insulin being difficult to afford, especially kids, they'll ration their insulin, not good. No bueno. All right. So um, another thing that you may see is this fruity breath. That's a, such a dead giveaway, though. They're probably not going to tell you that. Uh, they can get what's called Kussmaul respirations, which are fast, deep respirations. This is a sign of acidosis, of uh, acidemia, and um, this is a very late manifestation. A lot of times they also have abdominal pain, too. So that's kind of interesting. All right. So you should know this general presentation of DKA. Physical exam, naturally they're going to be dehydrated, and as a consequence, they'll be hypotensive, tachycardic, and in many cases, they'll be confused. Uh, diagnosis here, the best initial test is a BMP, basic metabolic profile. Check the electrolytes. What we're looking at here is the bicarb and the anion gap. Uh, there are other things that you will want to do. I mean, certainly you can get a finger stick glucose. That would be a good thing to order on CCS, a good thing to do in real life. Um, you know, it, it will give you hints. However, if you're doing a multiple choice question, get a BMP. Other things you want to do is a urinalysis, CBC, arterial blood gases, cultures, chest x-ray, and EKG. However, those are secondary. What we want to do to nail down the diagnosis is a bicarb and an anion gap. If you've got a patient with high glucose and a low bicarb in the setting of, uh, of all of these symptoms, uh, you've got a patient with DKA. All right, so this is kind of what you would see if you ordered all those things. I'm not going to rehash this. Now, the goals of therapy are going to be multifold. One, we want to restore the volume deficits. These patients tend to be four to six liters deficient in fluid. So we need to vigorously replenish their fluid. We want to resolve the hyperglycemia and acidosis. And then this is going to be really important we need to correct any electrolyte abnormalities here. Now, as we're going to see, these patients are going to tend to be hyperkalemic despite the fact that they have a deficit of potassium overall in their body. Um, and then we want to treat the precipitating event. That might be an infection. It might be a kid that needs to be told you've got to take your insulin. So immediately what you're going to do is fluids. Okay, start a normal saline bolus immediately. We're vigorously replacing fluids. 
Once you've diagnosed the patient, make sure check their potassium, then you're going to be administering normal insulin. Make sure that you are checking their electrolytes and their glucose every hour. If you're taking CCS, every hour you're going to be ordering those electrolytes. Now, potassium. This is so important here, so please pay attention. We want to target between 4 and 5. Now, what's going to happen? These patients are going to be hyperglycemic, and they're also going to tend to be high, hyperkalemic. If not hyperkalemic, they're going to have a much higher blood potassium than they actually have in their body. Okay, so what that means is that once we start giving them insulin, along with the sugar that's being pulled into the cells, they're also going to pull potassium into their cells. And so very quickly, they can develop a deadly hypokalemia. So what we do is we check their potassium. If they're between 3.4 and 5.2, which is roughly normal, um, then we will give potassium alongside their insulin. If their potassium is fairly high, over 5.3, um, then we will give the insulin and we'll hold off on the potassium because their potassium is pretty good. It's, it's, it's on the high end. We don't want to send them hyperkalemic, right? If their potassium is really low, 3.3, we want to give them potassium and hold off on the insulin because the insulin will drop them. Okay, so we're kind of playing this balancing act here. Um, but you got to make sure you know for your exam that when you are giving a very hyperglycemic patient insulin, You've got to make sure that you're checking their potassium and keeping them out of hypokalemia. Now, what do we do eventually? Well, once their glucose is under 250, which I know is high, but that's, that's the guideline. Once their glucose goes under 250, we switch them to D5 half normal saline. Once their anion gap normalizes, then we switch them from IV insulin to subcutaneous insulin. Now, that being said, very important for you to know, when we are monitoring the patient's response to therapy, we are monitoring their anion gap, not their glucose. I know it's very tempting because you think insulin, blood glucose. With DKA, we are monitoring their acidosis, just like it's in the name. So we're going to be uh, looking at their anion gap. Bicarb is only given with severe acidemia. Here we're talking like less than 6.9. So it, we rarely give it, and you can expect that to be the wrong answer. All right. Um, so uh, this is uh, sort of some final guidelines here. Make sure if you're taking CCS, if you send the patient off home, that you are including diabetes care management and uh, education. Now, hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state occurs in a completely different kind of patient. This used to be known as hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma, uh, but we changed the name for a couple reasons, which you can see here. The presentation, these are usually older, infirmed, type 2 diabetics, so they are older. Um, a lot of times they come from nursing homes, or uh, maybe they don't, but they're just non-compliant with their medication. What happens here is that they become very dehydrated, their volume contracts, and they kind of go into this death spiral. Um, so what we want to make sure that we do, again, like DKA, we want to replenish the fluids and find out the underlying cause. Now, these patients will present fairly similarly. However, they won't have acidosis. Um, so these patients are going to be altered mental status. Um, they'll often be thirsty and be peeing a lot. They're dehydrated, but they're not going to have that fruity smell to their breath so much. Uh, they're not going to be acid. They're not going to be in acidosis. Um, the problem, the, the main problem here is dehydration, really. Um, whereas with DKA, it was the acidosis in addition to the dehydration. The best initial test here, similarly, is going to be to get electrolytes. Because just like with DKA, infection can be a precipitating cause here, we want to make sure that we're eventually getting a chest x-ray, a head CT, and a CSF. Um, so that's going to be important, as well as the urinalysis. We're just looking for uh, infection where it might be. You might even add on a blood culture. These are some of your findings that you'll see. Please note, you will see a normal anion gap and a relatively normal bicarb, whereas in DKA, that bicarb was really down low in the basement with, uh, with HHS. You may see a slightly depressed bicarb, but for the most part, it's going to be pretty normal. Um, and Speaking of normal, so will the anion gap. That'll be normal as well. Whereas with DKA, you have an anion gap metabolic acidosis. 
The primary goal here is going to be replenish fluid volume and then replace insulin. Please note the same possible complications if you are giving insulin. Um, you got to make sure that you're supplying that with potassium depending on their potassium levels. So you're going to be watching that potassium level like a hawk. In unresponsive patients, remember if they are comatose, which most of them aren't, uh, you got to secure the airway. That could come up as a, as a question where they're just asking you about your ABCs. One to two liters of normal saline should be given over the first hour. Make sure, don't correct them too fast. You could send them into, uh, you, you could screw up their sodium levels and uh, you can cause them to have cerebral edema. So be very careful about that. But we want to replenish their fluids um, fairly quickly. And then, like I said, monitor the electrolytes, especially potassium. All these patients should be admitted while cause is being investigated. Um, they will have some neurologic sequelae, um, so you want to monitor that as well. Um, you can discharge them once neurologic symptoms have improved and uh, once you can be confident that they're going to be taking their medication and be well taken care of. For that reason, you may want to call social services and home care um, because they need to be in a place where they can take care of themselves or where they can be taken care of. Complications primarily due to the hyperviscosity, which promotes clotting. Um, so they can experience an MI, a stroke, or a pulmonary embolism. That's important for you to understand, and it's one of the big reasons why we need to get this treated very quickly.